Hey folks, Quilly King here and welcome to Let's Play Pathfinder Kingmaker. This is kind of a long overdue playthrough um, because this game has been out for a while and I love CRPGs. I mean, I love the hell out of Baldur's Gate. Um, I played through Neverwinter Nights and things way back in the day. Neverwinter Nights doesn't really hold up, in my opinion, the same way. I think because of the 3D engine, whereas Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 are just still wonderful, wonderful experiences. I love the, the Dragon Age series, uh, all those things. And somehow, some way, I never got around to playing Pathfinder Kingmaker. And today, Today I decided to load it up. And the reason is, actually, I'm going to be uh, DMing a D&D campaign relatively soon, and I thought I should immerse myself in a little bit more fantasy RPG kind of stuff. Maybe I can get some ideas, or at least get myself in the right headspace to do this. And I thought, oh, maybe it's time to finally play Pathfinder here. So that's what we're going to do. Now, I did start a game already, played for a little bit, tweeted about how much I liked it, people on Twitter asked about recording it, and Honestly, that seemed like a pretty decent idea, and I was already planning on restarting the game for one reason and one reason only. I originally made my character a bard, because there's a bard variant or kit, or I don't know what they call them in this game, called uh, Archaeologist, and I thought, oh, that's thematically, I thought that would be really fun. I could roleplay an archaeologist. Except one of the very first NPCs that you run into that you can recruit is a bard named Lindsay, and I knew from the moment I met Lindsay that they would have to be part of my party, and I think a party with two bards can work, but it did feel a little bit redundant. So I thought, well, if I'm going to be restarting anyway, Let's go ahead and get it recording. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. We're playing this main story here. Explore the Stolen Lands, a wild territory that has been contested for centuries. Hundreds of kingdoms have risen and fallen in these lands. And now it is time for you to make your mark by building your own kingdom. To succeed in this, you'll need to survive the harsh wilderness and the menace of rival nations, as well as perils from within your court. So it feels like it's going to be a little combination of uh, some uh, Dungeon Dragons-esque gameplay. I mean, obviously, this is Pathfinder, but you guys know what I mean. Some tabletop RPG kind of vibe, uh, combined with maybe a Crusader Kings experience. I have heard that um, the kingdom management part is probably the weaker part of the game, but... Still, reviews and 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 you know feedback about this game is that it is pretty good overall, and uh, we like kingdom management. So you know, as long as it's not painful or annoying, even if it's not like fully deep, I'm gonna be okay with it. So I'm I'm eager to see uh, what that leads for. So yeah, we're gonna be playing the main story now. I did give this some think. So it looks like challenging here is the base game rules, like you know proper tabletop Pathfinder, or at least as close as you get in a computerized version here. Um, and I thought about doing this. This is not recommended for people who aren't familiar with Pathfinder system. And I've never played the Pathfinder tabletop system, but I've played a ton of D&D and Pathfinder is very, this I believe is version one of the Pathfinder rules, which is very based on third edition D&D uh, &D, um, as opposed to version two of Pathfinder, which I've heard great things about. Um, and I think it's a little bit, uh, borrows a few more of the mechanics from like uh, fourth and, and maybe even fifth edition D&D. I guess a little bit more fourth edition, but even goes, goes off on its own direction a little bit more than the first edition of Pathfinder. Everything I'm saying here might be a complete lie. I really don't know Pathfinder at all. Um, but I suspect I would probably be fine and comfortable doing this. Now, however, for the sake of the Let's Play, I think I will leave it on normal over here. And the reason I'm going to do that is it does make critical hits a little less crunchy. So we're less likely to just instantly have a character die and then have to reload. Also, um, instead of dying the first time, you get this Death's Door trait. So again, instead of um, having someone die and we just reload it's going to be a little bit quicker to play through and uh, progress through the story. So that's why I'm kind of looking over here um, in terms of that. Yeah, it makes some things easier, but you know what? It just means we'll go a little faster, you know, rest a little bit less often. And I, I think I'm going to be fine with that. Um, party speed depends on the weight you're carrying. Which thing does get turned off over here? You know, maybe what I'll do is I'll go to challenging but I will nerf the critical hits. I will enable Death's Door. Um, I mean, theoretically, they won't die as often because of Death's Door anyway, so we can leave this off. Um, somewhat tougher enemies seems to be the default for challenging. Damage to party is set to normal, so we are going to take our full normal damage over here. Our speed's going to depend on the weight we're carrying. Uh, enable character retrain. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted that normal has that challenging doesn't is uh, I might end up making some mistakes in my builds, you know, because I'm not pre-planning everything because I don't really know what's coming. And uh, there is the ability, I think there's uh, NPCs you talk to in game that can allow you to retrain, respect your characters. And I do want that to be enabled. Uh, other than that, 
hopefully we're okay. I think last Aslanti mode is Iron Man. Yeah, only one save slot. Yeah, and immersive is what? Oh, disables interface hints and combats, lines of attacks, current enemy actions. Yeah, no, we'll leave that off. That's going to be okay. So let's go ahead and create a new character. Now, one of the things I don't know is if these portraits are used by... Um, like companions that you will find in game. Uh, that, that is one of the things in Baldur's Gate. So it can lead to a really funny thing where like you'll steal a portrait of someone you're going to meet in game. And then uh, when you run into that character, well, uh, in some games you might end up with a duplicate of the same photo in Baldur's Gate. It like sort of picks a different portrait, which means then they don't match their character very well. It's a whole thing. So I don't know if that's the case in here, but we're going to go for it. I decided to pick this guy's portrait over here because I am going to be playing an artificer. So again, the first character I rolled was an archaeologist. I made a bard archaeologist, sounded great, met Lindsay. They were also a bard. And I was like, you know what? Uh, that That is not going to do. So, um, but there's an artificer class, which is unique to Pathfinder. And I thought, well, that's quite cool. So, because it's not a baseline D&D um, thing. And I thought, all right, that'd be decent. And I, I'm thinking about party composition. I think you can go up to six characters in this game, um, but it does have XP splitting. So if you have fewer characters, you know, everyone levels up faster. So I, I might go with a smaller party. It might be a little easier to manage. I might base it around four. So the bard, me as the alchemist, uh, try to pick up a frontline fighter and then maybe a cleric who could also sort of be a frontliner uh, because they can wear heavy armor. Something like that might be a relatively re well-rounded party. I mean, we wouldn't have a hardcore arcane caster, um, but maybe it's fine. I don't know. In terms of race, so it, it you know, race comes first, but really I kind of want to look at class first over here. And so there's the alchemist. Um, and one of the things I was looking at, and I did do a very brief, just, you know, beginner tip on the alchemist to try to get a vibe for it. Um, and it did confirm things. It looks like the grenadier is probably just straight up better than the baseline alchemist, at least in the digital game over here. From my, my understanding in pen and paper, uh, in like tabletop Pathfinder, the alchemist might have more things for like item creation, things like that, which are not really represented in the game. So by picking the Grenadier, what we do is we lose access to poison immunity, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it, okay, we still get resistance. It's still in the flavor text here. It still says we'll become immune to poison, but I believe that this is just the same flavor text as the Alchemist. We're just going to get the second level here, which means we're going to get the plus four resistance to poison. So we're no longer going to be immune to poison as opposed to the baseline Alchemist. Um, but what we do gain, uh, there, there's something else as well, isn't there? I thought there was something else. But what we gain is, first of all, we gain martial weapon proficiency, which I don't think will be a huge deal. I mean, certainly we're not going to be looking at the melee martial weapons. I suppose, would this give us access to longbows that we wouldn't otherwise have, have access to? Well, that might be kind of vaguely useful. I don't know. Um, we also get the ability to infuse our weapons with alchemical uh, stuff. I don't know how useful that's going to be. Maybe it's great. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. But I think one of the big things is that we are going to get precise bomb for free over here, which makes our bombs not deal friendly damage. We're going to get that in level two, which I think is something you can get with these discoveries as well. But we get that for free, and then we still get to get a discovery at level two. So it just sounds like overall the Grenadier is a little bit stronger um, than the baseline. I did consider the Vivisectionist, who sounds a little bit nasty. Um, a, he, he seems to be a hybrid of the Alchemist plus a Rogue with a sneak attack. And I didn't really want to play the sneak attack vibe. I did sign that the the theme might have been fun, but I didn't want to do that. And the Shurgeon over here felt like a weaker version of the baseline Alchemist um, because you lose, um, you lose the poison immunity uh, line completely. You get infused curative over here, which lets us effectively use our heals on other people instead of just ourselves, but we can pick a discovery at level two that lets us use all of our abilities on our friends regardless. So this doesn't seem particularly useful here. So the Grenadier seemed like the better version of the Alchemist when I was looking at things. Anyway, we're, we're gonna go ahead and go with it. Um, there, there are a few extra uh, classes that aren't there in the baseline, the Slayer, which sounds like a like a ranger assassin hybrid type stuff, which does sound kind of fun. And it looks like we got some prestige classes over here we can grab later on, but I'm gonna be happy. Grenadier over here. Um, I believe our primary stat of interest for our spells, aka our infusions, is intelligence. Uh, but I do think we're gonna do a lot of range stuff as well. So dexterity sounds pretty good. Plus we don't wear heavy armor. 
Um, so dexterity is going to be good for our defenses. I don't know. Anyway, so with that, we can swing back over to race and make a decision here. Um, there are a lot of valid choices. But I think I was thinking half-elf. The perception is going to be useful. The immunity to certain effects over here is going to be good. And then with adaptability, the reason I kind of liked it is because... Um, I want my main character to be decent at talking to people, so I wanted to get uh, Persuasion, but it's not a class skill for Alchemist, so we'll always be a little bit behind on that. In terms of looks, I don't think I particularly care what my character looks like. He he's fine. That's fine. Should I give him a beard? Nope. Nope, no, nope, no. Nope. We're going to go with this. Excellent. So we're going to have a half-elf Alchemist. Next thing we have to do is allocate our ability points. So, yeah, you can see here we're getting the thumbs up on Dexterity and Intelligence. Um, what I'll probably be doing is... I'm going to bring my Intelligence up to at least the 16 and make that the stat that I get the plus 2 for my race at. I want to start with at least the plus 4 Intelligence. It's going to be really useful. Um, knowledge skills, skill points. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to want a decent amount of dexterity as well. So effectively, I've set both these to 16, and then we've got the plus two on intellect. Uh, one of my normal rules when playing D&D is that all my characters always have a con of 14, just to be non-squishy. That doesn't leave us with a whole lot of elves to play with. Now, we can take some points away, and actually, I was kind of impressed. If you bring it down to a seven, you actually get two points back. So, because I would like to get some charisma. I think that would be quite nice. Then after that, I'm not sure. Maybe I can still tank the strength, but maybe I'll bring the dexterity or the wisdom. Uh, well, to at least this, just to, you know, for saving throws, perception's kind of nice. I don't think perception's going to be our particular focus, though. I think skill-wise, um, we're going to have trickery here, which is going to let us uh, pick locks, then uh, disarm traps. Um, I am going to put points in the persuasion, even though it's cross-class, so we're not going to get as much value out of it, unfortunately. But... Um, from what I understand is sometimes your main character might be in a situation where they're by themselves and so their own persuasion skill will be useful. But otherwise in conversations it uses the best trait from the people in your party, which is kind of nice. I think we will go ahead and make our knowledge skills um, big. I mean, it kind of makes sense with the alchemist. I think he's going to be very knowledgeable. Um, we do have a high intelligence, so we are going to be putting a bunch in here. And I guess we were really going to want to specialize our party as much as possible or have each character really specialize in one of these skills um, because they can be used in, you know, various checks and conversations. So we'll do that. And then I'm going to put a point in use magic device, which is one of our class skills and will let us use all kinds of scrolls and wands and things like that that we might not normally be able to do so i think i'm okay with this for ourselves so we'll be responsible for disarming traps not necessarily spotting them we're definitely going to want someone else in the group with high perception we'd want, like someone else to have the lore skills around um most likely we are going to have someone else with a high persuasion because we can probably get someone with more persuasion than us i don't know if we'll ever end up with anyone with much in the way of stealth because I don't think we're going to look to necessarily recruit a pure rogue. Unless I go up to like a size 6 party, then maybe. But otherwise things are fairly covered. And I mean, I mean, there's probably checks where they use one person's highest stealth. Just based on how other things are going. I don't know, we'll find out. Um, oh, I still have an ability point. Well, I guess I'll put it into wisdom over here for now. Maybe we'll get an item that'll give us, you know, an extra point or something, and then we will no longer have a penalty to our will saving throw. I assume will saving throws are, yeah, they are a thing in here. Okay. Uh, abilities. So, uh, every character apparently in Pathfinder does start with a feat at level one, and then we start with the free feat of skill focus in a skill. So I'm going to put that in Persuasion to give me a plus three over here. And we will very likely keep dumping ranks into Persuasion, despite that it's cross-class. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it won't come up as very important. Then we get to pick our level one feat. So we are going to do a fair amount of range combat early on, but a lot of our damage comes from throwing bombs. I do like raising the DC against saving throw against my bombs. I don't know my first bombs... They have saving throws, because right now my baseline bomb deals 1d6 points of fire damage, plus int. Increases every other level. Splash. Those caught in a splash get a reflex save for DC. Okay, so it would do that. I don't know. I think we might grab point blank shot over here, 
Because I, I suspect we're going to do a fair amount of combat at ranges within 30 feet, and then we'll have plus one to hit and damage on our ranged weapons. I don't know if our bombs count as that. I, I sort of suspect the answer is no. But I think it'll still be relatively valuable for us. Persuasive. An even bigger bonus on persuasion and perception checks. I mean, maybe something like that will happen. Is this toughness good or not? Plus three. So it's basically one extra hit point per level. Yeah. And then extra. You get you get three right off the bat, but at that point it just becomes one per level. Um, that's not a tremendous amount of hit points. It's not bad. It's the same as plus two con, which I'm you know certainly not going to complain about, but I'm not sure we're going to start with that. We do start with light armor proficiency. Yeah, let's take the point blank shot. I think that's going to be nice when we start off. And, wow, we can know a lot of spells. Holy crap. Um, I think I think this alchemist variant, I think they still quote-unquote memorize spells. Effectively, I think what they're doing, they're preparing potions at the start of the day, or infusions. Uh, so we do have to prepare our spells. But um, We're going to grab Cure Light Wounds and Shield. So, by default, these only target myself. But I believe once we get a discovery at level 2, we'll be able to use shield on other people. And then it becomes a really good sort of utility save for frontline fighters and things like that. Um, the targeted bomb admixture I was looking at, when you throw a bomb, this will remove their splash damage. However, instead of splash damage, it's going to add... Um, double my intelligence modifier to my base damage. This is sort of a boss killing kind of thing. I don't like that it only lasts one round per level. That is not very, you know, yeah, there's not much of a lifespan, but it might still be useful. Um, there's also Bomber's Eye over here, which again doesn't last very long. Gives us plus one to hit. So I guess these count as thrown weapons. Or maybe not. Well, because it increased my range by 10. In addition, you get plus one inside on attack rolls made with thrown weapons. I wonder if this counts as a thrown weapon, my bomb. I don't know. I like the idea of enlarge person, you know, enlarge a tank or about the, one of the frontliners so that they get more strength and are more smashy, although it does hurt their AC. I think what might almost be better is reduce person because it shrinks someone, which, you know, is bad for their, their strength and their strength damage, but... Um, it increases their dexterity and gives them a plus one bonus on attack rolls and AC. So this is really good throw on range people because they'll effectively be getting plus two to hit because of the dexterity side and plus two to their AC. Well, I guess anyone will because of the extra dexterity and the base AC. This might be a good utility spell. I don't know. I don't know about enlarge person the same way. I guess it also increases the base damage that those creatures use, maybe. I like Expeditious Retreat normally. I don't know how useful it's going to be in this game, but like in pen and paper, I really kind of like that. I don't think we're going to go with Stone Fist or Fire Belly. And there we go. We've, I mean, we've picked up a lot of spells. And I think we'll learn another one at level two, so I don't think we're going to be hurting for the actual knowledge of spells we have access to. Uh, so we're going to be Quill. And we are definitely going to be pragmatic. I'll go ahead. This will hurt. Because that, be that's going to be the vibe of our character over here. Uh, what makes a man turn neutral is going to be our vibe here. We are going to espouse really sort of utili utili utilitarianism? Utilitarianism? I don't know. Basically, you know, we're going to be basing our philosophy on the idea of, of choices that lead to a greater good. But, you know, not, not from the source of goodness as in, you know, like charity and, and things like that. But overall think we're going to justify our decisions as this as a whole will make everyone a little bit better off in some way. And if, you know, two choices are equal, well, then whichever one benefits me the most is obviously the right choice because I am more valuable than everyone else because I have main character syndrome, which in this situation is actually correct. <laughs> but that's what we're going to base it on. Um, here we go. Fourth month, 30th day. There you go. It's my birthday. We'll have the same birthday over here. Anyway, I think that's going to be that for my character setup here. Dead yet. And what I'll do is I guess I'll put a cut in here. So that way the first video will just be the character creation. And people can then skip to the next video if they just want to go into the gameplay right away. But hopefully I haven't made any horrible, disastrous moves yet. I guess we'll find out. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.